may request Dr. Anika Amritanam to give the first talk on cluster end of thermotis, end of thermotis and overview and investigation. Before we proceed, the chairperson was supposed to be Dr. R.D. Ravindran. He is held up in another session and will join us shortly, Dr. Anika. Dr. Anika is the professor and head of the outreach services in the Department of Ophthalmology, CMC Velo. Respected chairperson, panelists, and friends, uh, it's an honor for me to be giving this talk today, and I'm grateful to the Vision 2020 Scientific Committee for giving me this opportunity. Cluston endophthalmitis is a horrific nightmare for the patient, the surgeon, and also has far-reaching consequences for the institution as well as the ophthalmic fraternity at large. And if we need to control this beast, we need to know about it. We need to recognize an outbreak when it's occurring, investigate it, and also in our normal day-to-day -day practice, have a continuous documentation and surveillance system so that we can pick up outbreaks. What happened? Sorry, something. Just, yeah. So cluster endophthalmitis, is, it usually arises in an OT or sometimes not even in an OT circumstance because of a common source of contamination. It occurs in more than one patient in an incidence which is much higher than what is the normal sporadic incidence. The organisms are mainly gram-negative or fungal, as compared to the sporadic, where the commensals or patient-related factors are most common. This is a review which just uh, kind of shows, I've just put it there to highlight the myriad places from which a patient can get infected. Could be anything which comes into contact with the eye, as well as the common pathogens. Intraocular solutions have been the culprits in most studies. However, this could even be because they are the most amenable to a microbiological evaluation and not just that that needs to be analyzed further. Also to note that sometimes you may not even have a source, you may not even identify a source around almost 50% of the time, even if you investigate. Uh, the second thing I want to bring out is the changing trend in cluster on ophthalmitis. These are some recent studies from India and we see more and more clusters being reported after intravitreal injections. Newer organisms which are emerging and also highly resistant organisms which are emerging and that needs to be a caution to all of us. Now what is important is to recognize an outbreak or a cluster from what is the normal regular endemic rate of endophthalmitis which we may experience. The AIOS and ESCRS guidelines say that when two or more cases operated on the same day in the same operation theater, that constitutes a cluster endophthalmitis. That is easy to recognize because if you have two or three cases occurring on a day, you obviously know that something is wrong. But what is important is to realize that cluster endophthalmitis can occur over days and weeks, and it's important to recognize it from a sporadic outbreak. And the general definition for that is that the incident rate is significantly over than what is expected. So how do we start recognizing an outbreak? The first patient of endophthalmitis we get, we need to determine whether it's an endophthalmitis or a TAS or, a, or an increased post-operative reaction. And if it's an endoph or a TAS, both of these need a proper investigation to find the cause and to mitigate it. Each of the cases of endothelmitis needs a proper review and documentation for the patient factors, pre-op, intra-op, post-op, as well as the environment and surgery-related factors. So when do we start thinking there is an outbreak? If there is a common organism or source which we are finding related to each of those cases, obviously more cases in less number of time, and a rate that is significantly over that is expected. Uh, from a current review, our country rate is around 0 0.08 to 0 0.16, which is around 1 in 1,250 to 1 in 625 infections. We have statistical methods which help us find a balance between complacency and panic. 
So this is a table taken from a very hallmark publication which has been used by several guidelines to guide determining whether there is an outbreak and what our action should be. So this is a probability table which tells us keeping a sporadic rate of one per thousand surgeries as to how many number of cases are expected within so many number of operations. So these numbers are actually probabilities and this gave us the classical traffic light system which says that if the probability of your infections is less than 0.01% of happening at a sporadic rate, that is your indication for an emergency. You stop surgeries, you form an expert team and start a full-blown evaluation. There are other methods which you could be used depending upon your uh, milieu, depending upon the number of cases you operate. However, the take-home point is we need to be vigilant and actively monitor our incidents because clusters have been known to even occur over months. So if an, in, if, uh, an outbreak happens, then what do we do? So basically it becomes an epidemiological exercise, just like the first one by Dr. John Snow, who found the source of the infection in a hand pump. So we need to find our hand pump for our cluster of cases. Patients need to be recalled, temporarily closed theaters, form a multidisciplinary team, preferably someone external who will be able to find our blind spots, um, consist, uh, consisting of microbiologists, epidemiologists, if possible, have a timeline and information of all the cases documented, review all processes, all surgical processes, the systemic processes, sterility processes, take appropriate cultures. The importance of a good vitreous sample and early and a good microbiological diagnosis is paramount because unless you know what is causing the problem, you will be just shooting in the dark when you're looking for the cause. And of course, informing all concerned, the authorities, the DBCS of your district, and uh, sometimes even uh, the societies when an outbreak is occurring. For smaller hospitals, it is also important to talk to your other hospitals to see if similar cases are occurring so that you can pick up a trend. Obviously, microbiology needs to be done for, for all the potential sources and the patient. But if you get the same organism from two places, uh, then we have molecular techniques to actually help confirm if these were from the same source. So this is a case study when 20 isolates from a hospital which had an, uh, an outbreak were sent to our microbiology department and we were able to determine that it was the same organism using molecular technique. So this is helpful not just in finding the source and eliminating it, but it also is a safeguard to surgeons and uh, to institutions. Uh, its investigation is not just about microbiology, uh, we need to look at our processes. This study by Bayard et al. showed that there were actually 24 points from the time a patient enters the hospital to getting discharged where you could have a potential source of infection. So you need to see the processes, look at the microbiology, and then come up with a plan. So this is an example of when in 2007, we had two cases of pseudomonas endophthalmitis over four days. The vitreous staph, and the Ringer lactate, which was used then, grew the same organism with the same sensitivity pattern. However, when we did the culture for the batch of fluid, it was sterile. So it was deduced that the contamination probably occurred during IV bottle handling. And at those, in those days, we were still using antibiotic and adrenaline in the fluid, and that led to a change in practice of stopping that and reviewing our hand hygiene processes. So when you have a cluster, you, will have, you, sh you, you should come up with something like this, information about all your cases. And looking at this, then you will be able to find clusters or find common commonalities, which will help you further in the investigation. But for this to occur, there needs to be a continuous surveillance and documentation. This does not need to be filled for each patient, only for the patients with suspected end of or TAS, but the source of these data points needs to be there in your system so that they can be collected and 
uh, documented and proper sense made out of what we have done so that our investigation is focused. I will end with a few other essentials which we need. Very important to communicate in larger hospitals with your colleagues, with other units, uh, with your uh, with uh, societies, as well as in other countries, they also have registries, which are very, very important. A heightened awareness and quick response is very important. A lot of eyes have been saved when patients were actually picked up during evening rounds uh, because they had symptoms which were out of the ordinary. I've already spoken about recording and documentation. These are just some pictures of what are the things we record, like you know, records of the OT air, the regular surveillance, the changing of the sterility indicators, etc., and continuous training of your existing and new staff so that no uh, protocols are broken. Thank you very much.